Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Now available on Apple Podcasts, Podcast One, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. The following program is a Podcast One.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. All right, once again, welcome. Steve Austin Show, Bootleg in Atlanta with Scott Hall. We're going to try this three times. Scott, how you doing? You look like you're a million bucks. Thanks. Last time I saw you, Resurrection of Jake Roberts, you weren't in a good place, but you look 100% right now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We started off talking, and the camera crew was having a hard time with your mic. You told a couple of stories that were pure gems. What I was going to attempt to do today was kind of trace over some of your steps. I've got some notes here, but you busted out with two great stories, so there's no better way to start a podcast with a couple of stories. One was down there in... Uh, was it W? What, it was NWA. It was a Tully Blanchard story. Oh yeah, yeah. Where okay. he was telling you it's right. about about getting over. Right. So launch mid story. Uh, start over. What were we talking well, about? Well, I haven't had a match. I, Dusty started me in, in Florida, but I never had a match. So now I moved to Charlotte. But you're trained by Hero Matsuda. Yeah. So how was that training then? Well, Hero was so old school. We he had like a sewing shop where he had ladies who made gear. Yeah. Like but shooter gear for amateur schools right. and stuff like that. And he had like a little place in the beginning where it was just, we just worked out. There was, there was no ring. What did y'all do, just Hindu squats? Hindus and push-ups. The thing I'll say about Hero is he's not one of those guys who sits in the chair and tells you to do 500 squats. He does them, then you do them. Right. And I had heard about Hero before I got there. So I went there in shape. Right. I was doing, I was doing them on my own at home. Right. Now, he still blew me up, but I got right. You know, I quit back. I backed off on the weightlifting at that time because that high rep squat will blow you up. And right. I, was, I was huge back then. Well, we were already 280, 290? Yeah, like 290, yeah. squatting 600 for Jesus reps. Jesus Christ. It's just, it was a different yeah. era. Yeah. I remember, too, like sometimes, like he would go, oh, lower, not too low. And I got to the point where I got comfortable with him. Like he was doing my deep looking at him, like, hey, buddy. Yeah, yeah, come on. But, uh, what I mean, did he teach you then? I mean, you're doing hinders, you're doing... Well, it, 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 you know, the business was different then. It was like, well, let's run this guy off. Nobody right. was welcomed in. So, you know, he was going to run me off. And I ran into Barry Windham in a grocery store. And, I, you know, I was trying to be real respectful. I bought tickets to see him wrestle that right. week. Right. And, it, and I went, hey. I, and he looked at me, hey, man. And uh, we're both... Did, his eyes kind of go like... Well, we're both looking at steaks. He goes, hey, man, what's up? I said, why are you Barry Windham? I'm a big fan. He goes, yeah. He goes, uh... What do you do, man? Because at that time, there was the Tampa Bay Bandits. There was the Buccaneers. Right. There was wrestlers. There was a lot of big guys in right. Tampa. And he go, I said, no, actually, I'm trying to get into your business. He went, oh. Now, I had no idea that Hero was even connected with the office. They right. already knew. I didn't know. Yeah. And he goes, uh, he goes, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm working out with Hero Matsuda. He said, screw Hero Matsuda. <laughs> Typical said, Barry Wendell. He said, you'll just be doing Hindu squats around the building. He said, do you know where the sportatorium is? I'm thinking, yes, sir. And he goes, meet me there tomorrow noon. And I'm thinking, this is Barry Wyndham, big star. Damn right. And he's got a dri- it's Wednesday. He's going to drive to Miami that night. He wants yeah. to meet me at noon, then he's going to drive to Miami. Okay. But I get there at 11, just in case. In comes Barry with Mike Rotundo, and the first bump I ever took was in that ring. I laid down, Steve, and they picked me up around the shoulders and the knees, lifted me up and dropped it, like to feel it like that. I bumped Barry while, while Mike watched. I bumped Mike while Barry watched. They, I didn't get bumped at all. And it, you know, it was unbelievable these guys took the time to do that for me. That was my first time ever in a wrestling ring. Then Dusty, then things were changing. Dusty took the book in Charlotte, and boom. Now it's like, hey, kid, need you in Charlotte. Ah, I haven't even had a match yet. You hadn't? No. So did, did Barry, because of his uh, alliance and relationship with Dusty, say, hey, there's this big, good-looking guy. We think he can do something. I mean, because how did Dusty get the word on the street? He didn't know you. I don't know. You know for me, it, it goes like you go from being on the outside. Yeah. Like you go from buying tickets and stuff. All of a sudden, you're on the inside. Nothing really changed. But now, I, they're giving me free tickets to come to the shows. Gotcha. And now I get to come in the locker room. You know, so I get to hang around. I'm going, holy cow. I'm marked out. It's huge. Right. And then... It turns out I live right down the street from Barry. So he goes, hey. And there wasn't, there wasn't, YouTube wasn't around back no, then. There was no, no there was no network. There was no way to study stuff. So Rotunda said to me, you got cable TV? I said, yeah. He goes, well, watch as much wrestling as you can. There, were, there was no NXT. The way you learned then was watching. Right. You go to the building, you get there early, and maybe hope some guy would show you a thing or two. Right. Because a lot of guys in that era, nobody bumped for free. Like, yeah. no way. Especially with some big career ender. Yeah. So I, I remember riding in the back of the car, and I was the beer tender. 
you know, with yeah. Mike and Barry and just sitting back, just listening, just learning. Dude, you know? that was awesome. Unbelievable. So then, then how did you end up? Okay, getting, so now, getting, here, now I finally have a match or two. And this is when the business, to me, was really changing. It was becoming more about TV and more about marketing, and it, you had to have the look. You know, a lot of like little kids are more or the audience now. They're going, well, I think that big muscle guy could beat that fat guy. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what a good performer you are. Right. It's the, it's the matchmaker's job to put the performer with the guy who might be able to sell merch. Right. It was changing then. So I was too big to do jobs and too green to go over. Right. So I never got to work. I was in Charlotte. Dude, that is an interesting predicament. Well, luckily, uh, Jim Crockett owned the Charlotte Orioles. So I worked on the ground screw there. That's what I heard. And it was sweet, and it only rained twice a year, so you know, pulled the tarp out twice. It was it was good times. It was really good times. So then Dusty sent you guys to Charlotte and Crockett territory. Well, du I tag along with Dusty. He's taking the book there. Dory Funk left Charlotte and went to Florida to book, and Dusty came in there. Charlotte was down. Dusty brought Steamboat in. Steamboat had retired. He brought Steamboat back. Um, Tagged with Manny Fernandez and put the world belts on him. I mean, they're, the territory was down. They were really trying to bring it up. There was no time to school me. So I just kind of sat around. Knowing this, I begged Dusty to send me to Kansas City where I could be in the ring every night. Right. For 50 a night. It was a big pay cut, but not really because you only work once a week as opposed to six nights a week. Well, so then what did you learn in, in, in uh, Kansas City? I mean, I was, ta I was talking to, to Jake about getting over. I mean, what was your approach? Because now, as Razor, once you assume that gimmick, and we're going to get to that in a minute, you, you know how to get over. Back then, what was your mantra? What was your M.O.? Well, I, you know, I bounced around to some different territories, and I feel like I learned some stuff along the way. I, didn't, I don't think, I think you only learn when you're around guys who know more than you, and I wasn't around anybody who knew more than me. I crossed paths with Shawn Michaels in Kansas City, and I remember taking, making a road trip to him one time, Kansas City to Des Moines. And Sean, when he was doing jobs in Dallas, used to call the matches to the guys going over. Really? He was that good. What were your impressions of a young Shawn Michaels? Well, at that time, they, I was booked as a heel, so I thought, finally, some little pretty boy like, that, that yeah. will toss around. I can toss around, and he's not, he doesn't have a problem with it. Right. You know, a lot of those guys, you know, they don't want to be bumped or anything, you know, and, and not by me. Right. So, I don't know, we, always, we hit it off. I think we had a lot in common then, you know, a little smirky smile and... I don't know. We've been friends since then. Well, what about the, uh, the, the, the tag team American Starship with Dan Spivey? Now, me and Danny was the thing where they put us together and we didn't know each other. And we don't know each other that well now. We never really hung out before or since. And, you know, I don't have anything against Danny. He's a great guy. Right. But we just didn't click. And he... What was the gimmick? I mean, American Starship, you're, you're, you're Starship Coyote, right. which would give years later, you end up with a wolf pack. So, yeah. I mean, you know, there's a genesis there, but he was American Starship Eagle. Yeah. What, the, what, what is American Starship? I don't know. Sounds I... great. What is it? I have no idea. It's Dusty. That's Dusty. Yeah. He, we were going to see, now Dusty was still booking Florida. And I often wonder, looking back, had he not left, what would have happened? Because he was getting, we were going to be his road warriors. Right. You know, two big muscle heads. You know, that's what somebody did with the warriors, just took two guys and right. pushed them. And it worked. So Dusty was going to do that. Now, had we been in Florida under Dusty's thing, it would have been a whole different deal. But it didn't happen. So uh, you didn't really know Dan Spivey. Uh, what, how was it like going down the road with you guys? I mean, he, well, he's a pretty salty guy. No BS. No, if you no. Mr. Spivey, he's probably going to duke you out. Yeah, Danny's a big badass, and he, uh, you know, he had a lot of success in Japan. You know, he kind of liked that style better. I just, um, he, he wasn't real happy with the, the decision to move from Charlotte. It was all me. Right. Begging Dusty to hook me up with Harley so I could go there. Right. Because I wanted to be in the ring every day. Danny would rather take the 200 a night and work once a week. And I'm thinking, no, I'd, right. take, I'd rather work every night. Right. And I was more interested in being a single wrestler anyway. Uh, why is that? Because I, for me, it's always a liability factor. Dude, if your partner gets, goes down, right. dude, you're, 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 you're screwed. Yeah. And, Was uh, it the same for you, or you just wanted the spotlight on you? I, probably, I think I probably wanted the spotlight on me. Right. You know, I mean, if I'm going to make it, I'm, you know, no one ever breaks in to work their way to the middle. I mean, I had dreams of being a big star and being a single guy. So somewhere along the way, uh, you impressed Nick Bockwinkle and Larry Zabisco, and you head up to the AWA. I actually crossed paths with Jack Lanza in St. Louis because they used to bring guys in from the AWA, from Charlotte, and from Dallas to run big shows in St. Louis. And the opening match guys would be the Kansas City crew. We would drive in, be the opening matches, and leave. 
So I'm in the locker room, and Lanza looks at me and he goes, hey, kid, you ready to make a move? And I said, no, sir, I'm not ready. And he goes, everybody's the shits when they start. And I said, in, in that case, I'm ready. Right. Like, as long as you feel that way, bro, cool. So he took me, and that was the beginning of my AWA run. Okay, and you go in as, uh, how long did it come up, how long did it take you to come up with the Magnum Scott Hall gimmick? Actually, at, at that time, I got so much heat for that. Lord James Blears. Lord, <laughs> Lord James Blears was the announcer. Yeah. At this time, Char- now Barry has left Charlotte, where he was getting a big baby face shove. He right. left because he wasn't happy with the terms. And they brought Magnum in, and they had to hot shot Magnum. Right. Because Barry was getting mega pushed. Right. And he just left. I was with him. He got his check. We were in the parking lot. Right. I'm, I'm riding with him. He looks at his check, and he went, Pfft. And he went right inside, and he gave his notice. Dude, that's so Barry went and then And then he came back out, and I said, Mark, I'm going to wait here. I don't want this heat, you know. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to wait out here, brother. And he went in, and he came back, and he goes, well, help. He told me not to worry about two weeks. I'm out of here now. And he went right to Vince. Really? Yeah. Now, Rotundo gave us notice and went in, and they did the U.S. Express right. or whatever. You know, right, right, Rotundo right. Was, did what he had to do, but I don't know, man. So, so and, and, but the territory, I mean, dude, Barry was, you know, second generation guy, hardcore business guy, one of the, to me, one of the greatest of all time. Yeah, I'm a and huge dude, just, I, I, I don't he, like the pay, I'm out. Yeah, he's not a mark about it. He don't right. care about belts and stuff like that or right. all the push or anything. No, like, okay, no, I'm right. a, I'm a, uh, this is pro wrestling. Right. Pro meaning get paid. Okay, so the hot shot Magnum So meanwhile, they hot, they're hot shot Magnum trying to make up for this void for Barry. Right. So it's Magnum, Magnum, Magnum. And at the same time, now this Lord James Blear is that we're, we're wrestling in, in the Showboat Casino in Las Vegas. By the way, the big drawing card at the Showboat is they have bowling alleys. Right. That's kind of the place <laughs> yeah. it is. Nothing against bowling. But, uh, and, this guy's, and this guy lives in Hawaii. We're in there filming Magnum P.I. back there then. So the guy sees Selleck around town. He comments, oh, he looks like that's a Magnum Scott. I, said, I have no idea this is going on. This is a commentator saying yeah. this. I never said it on the interview. I never claimed that character. Right. So it's right away heat with. TA. You know, right. Like, uh. I remember years later when I came into work trying to get a job, it was like Scott Hall and WCW, and Magnum was working in the office. He goes, Yeah, we can probably give you a look. Of course, you're going to have to get your own identity. <laughs> and I remember thinking, Yes, sir. Like, whatever. How long, how, how long did you work as a singles before you uh, tag up with Kurt Henning? Well, when I got to Minneapolis, that's when the first time I worked for a big company that kind of knew what they were doing. And now, how was that territory back, uh, back then? Because when I got it, because TV was so regional back then, I caught the downside of the AWA. Yeah, it was hard as yet, but there was the heyday years when it was. Well, and I, I came in right. I remember. I'll never forget one time wrestling in Chicago at the Rosemont, and it was nearly full. Now I've never been in front of a crowd that big. I've been wrestling in front of fifty people in bumfuck Kansas. Right, and they. Michael, I'll never forget the Freebirds were there, and I'm a huge Freebird fan. And, oh, Michael, and Michael Hayes goes, man, we're out of here. This place is dead. <laughs> and I'm thinking, whoa. And, but I remember thinking, whoa. And, it, and the houses were going down. They were still big houses to me. Right. But they were going down. Right. Now, they put me with Henning because Henning was such a great performer, and I wasn't. And they liked how I looked. So Kurt would sell, tag me, I'd pin the guy. Right. You know, that's what they were doing. And it was work. It was working to the point where people were yelling from the Iowa, like, oh, get a new partner. Hennig's holding you down. I was going, no, no, he's not. They don't, yeah, they don't understand he's what you're doing. Me up. Go back uh, 15 seconds. You talked about uh, Freebirds, uh, Michael Hayes, Bam Bam, Gordy, and uh, Buddy Jack Roberts. Uh, Hall of Fame material or not? I, definitely. If it doesn't happen this year, if it doesn't happen in Dallas, I oh said my the same God. thing. I'll never forget one time, it, it, we're doing TV in Atlantic City. It's ESPN, so this is national exposure right. for me. These guys don't care who this big muscle. A lot of the guys are, oh, this guy's getting a push. He can't do anything. A lot of that going on. It's not my fault. Right. But I'm happy about it. Yeah. And, but the birds aren't marks. They don't care. Their job is to make the kid look good. Okay. It was a six man, me, Slaughter, and Hennig against the birds. Yeah. So I'm in with Buddy. He goes, block the slam, slam me. Right. Because I don't know anything. Right. And I get him Still. here. Still. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And as I'm here, he goes, watch for Michael. Because if he didn't say that, I wouldn't have known. Because yeah. I'd have been standing there filling yeah. space, and Michael had yeah. been like running in place, waiting for me. So I say, I'm him, boom. He came fed right in, boom. Now, and I'm here, he goes, watch for Terry. Boom, here comes Terry, <laughs> boom. Now, I mean, back in the day, three slams. Wow. Three slams in a row. On the Freebirds? Boom. Yeah. 
I'm marked out now thinking about it. Yeah. And I'm so I'm firing and stuff, and Kurt's on the apron going, Tag, Scott, Scott, Scott. And I look around, and he goes, Tag Sarge, Tag Sarge. Sarge had gotten down off the apron and was sitting in the front row. Really? Like, you guys don't need me. Oh. And that's when I started learning, like, okay, not everybody's, you know, the little. With the program. The little, yeah. the, the things, the ways work. A lot of guys are cheering and going, Pfft. Right. I don't know. I mean, it opened my eyes. Like, oh, okay. I get it. Oh, yeah. Sarge feels like we're competing for the thing. I'm thinking, right. no, man, you're here. Well, I mean, but, dude, they came in, shined you up, and boom, he takes a powder, and you know, he's sulking over there. Yeah, that's how I looked at it. Right. So, dude, how was it when all of a sudden you got a guy midway, midway up? He said, watch for Michael. Or watch, for, watch for Bam Bam. I, I mean, that had to be like light bulb going off and like, well, you're, you're about to be well, Bam Bam. Now, and now, and now yeah. I get to the point where I'm working with guys going, well, then is he going to feed? Right. You know, now you start expecting yeah. it, you know. Yeah. And, and it's the right thing. Vince doesn't allow that anymore. Really? That's what somebody told me that. If you watch tag matches now, you know how back in the day guys would feed, but bang. Yeah, 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 yeah. I heard they can't do that anymore. Oh, dude. And see, that's one of the big things. I, I was trying to talk with Edge and Christian about some of the nuances that are lost in today's tag team, you know, scene. And, you know, not to rehash the entire conversation, but, you know, cutting off the ring, using those right. tag ropes to choke somebody. You can't choke somebody anymore because it's not PC or just, you know, everything that's happened in the past. But, dude, the whole thing, blind tag, false tag, turning that referee, getting some heat, using the top ropes, cheating. I remember, yeah, I always... I tried to. I remember when Shawn Michaels first broke up from the Rockers, and then Marty went on his way. So Shawn's a single wrestler as a heel by himself, and I'm traveling with him every day. Right. And you know I've known him since Kansas City, and we got heat with everybody because we're getting pushed, and we don't care. You know I'd rather get along with everybody, but I really don't right. care. And so we're riding up and down the road, and I go, Shawn, can I, can I ask you something, man? I said, you know, yeah. And I said, you're one of the best technical wrestlers out there. And now, because you're heel, you just kick and punch? I said, no, man, it's your personality that makes you heel, not your moves. You know, like Nick Bockwinkel was a wrestling heel. Right. He would always wrestle, then he'd just use the ropes a little bit to gain the advantage yeah. and go back yeah. to and you yeah. go, you son of Yeah, yeah. That's the kind of stuff I like. I remember me and Kev, when we were teaming as the Outsiders, we would always do false tag. And, and we would always cheat because we were popular. And yeah. we were acting like baby faces. Right. I mean, but we cheated. Yeah. But, I mean, we were over because we were off yeah. Vince's TV. It was a weird yeah. time. Yeah. You know, you went through it with yeah. the whole, you were, you were anti baby face. So what did Sean say when you told him, hey, so now you're here? Well, he, I, I, I went, no, did he go, oh, eyes open? Yeah. yeah. And it was, uh, I mean, I remember when, then I had to work against Sean. They booked Razor versus Sean in the garden. And we're both heels. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, well, they're going to be with Sean. He's like, young, pretty boy. And he's going, well, I'm not sure, but if, if they go with you, just act surprised. Like, if they start to go razor, he goes, you know, because right. we were never going to the people. Right, right. You know, I didn't like that. But if Hardly you, anybody you, did back but then. But you do the, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it's way better. Yeah. Then, they, then they're watching you. Right. It's We work them. They don't work us. Right. But it, they came with me big, and it was like, I act like, you know, like, eh. But then went back to. Yeah. But and then he, before the match, he went, well, how am I going to get you to sell? Because he came from that era when he's working with Warlord. Marty drop kicks him, Sean drop kicks yeah, him, yeah. double drop kick. He goes, yeah. And I said, punch me. Like, you know, dude, get on me. I'm going to sell, you know. And it was like all new to him. Like, oh, God, somebody will sell for me. Yeah. And, he's, and he's so stiff that yeah. you don't have my choice anyway. <laughs> But, uh, you mentioned uh, Rosemount Horizon. Uh, I was on a podcast talking with Edge and Christian, their favorite building to perform in, mine too, because the acoustics of that building and how crazy that crowd is. The garden is special. Uh, that's one and two for me. Your favorite building to work in? Wow. Um, Everybody's got one. You know, I don't know. Wow, the, the Rosemont's there. I, I would think the garden. I had, you know, I had some special matches there. My last, the last time I was in the garden was the celebration they did for Hulk. Yeah. But prior to that was the curtain call. I know. So that, that place has always been special to me. I still wish that, gosh, I can't think of the record, uh, recording artist's name now, but she sings that song, Give Me One Reason to Stay Here. Right. And I'll turn right back around. I mean, that's what I wanted to walk to the ring to. Right. I didn't want to leave there. I didn't want to leave. Right. But I'll, tell, I'll say this for Vince, he never sold. He, we, I mean, the buildings were sold out. Right. Kev's on top, I'm semi-main, and he's not selling I want to come to that here, here in just a little bit because that, that was a big part of my career. I know. And a big part for the, for the turning point of the business and guaranteed money. Geico asks, 
How would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Of course you would. And when it comes to great rates on insurance, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners or renters coverage. Plus, add an easy-to-use mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And GEICO is an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save. It's simple. Go to GEICO.com or contact your local agent today. Uh, and working with, with Kurt Henning and, and uh, uh, kind of under his arm, what did you learn from that guy? One of the smartest cats in the business and one of the greatest workers of all time. I agree. And I'm so amazed by Kurt and influenced by him because... But how giving was he? He took me when I first showed up in WWF. He took me into the production truck to meet Kevin Dunn. He goes, you got to know this guy. And then, dude, so I know... He smartened me up about that. He taught me early on, ba- always babyface the crew. Right. You know, always babyface right. the crew guys. Right. Because then it gets to the point where I'm doing something, and I'll take the guy, and i go, hey, is there any place I could stand there where you guys could shoot me better? And the guy goes, actually, if you move up a couple feet here and there and stuff like that. But Kurt was so unselfish, because this is before guaranteed money. So as far as he knows, we're competing for the same job, top right. baby face. But he does all the work in the in the sh- in the matches right he always started the match because he said no we're gonna get a pop just you coming in now, right. now you want the big guy like i always started again with kev yeah because like no now you're gonna get it yeah and he did all those things he always sold tag me he was never a mark about that and he was just he he got off on smartening people up right you know i mean i remember he told me early on he would always grab the young guys and put them in the car and always pay face and have him ride with him, stuff like that. And then he go, be nice to everybody. Never know who they turn out to be. <laughs> he always had an angle on it. Right. But he was always, I, and you got to remember now, Shawn Michaels crossed paths with Kurt then in AWA. And I think Kurt influenced Shawn. It all came about, I think, like, if it's your night, like, if you're going over, then you're going over, bro. It's not going to be, oh, I barely kick out. Right, you're beating right. me. You're beating me. Right. Like, you're going to make a hell of a comeback, then beat me. Like, let's don't just, you know, I never understood guys who kick out on three. Like, right. Oh, I almost didn't lose. Right. I never got that. So you, you end up uh, AWA for, for, what, four or five years? Three or four? Yeah, but yeah three maybe. A cup of coffee in Puerto Rico. You end up in WCW. I left. Uh, in the meantime, I'd had success in Japan and in Europe. I never had any success in the U.S. where it mattered. Working with Otto Wants? I worked for Otto, Otto Wants, more to eat. <laughs> now, now, how was that over there? Were y'all working five-minute rounds, or were y'all working straight through? Three-minute rounds. Three-minute rounds. And uh, Tell me about that. Well, to me, it was kind of cool because I've never met a guy from the U.K. who couldn't work. Oh, yeah. Who didn't have psychology. And those and, guys were all uh, way more technical than most of the American wrestlers. Yeah, it was all chain wrestling because right. the ring was like a billiard table. So I got to learn some of that. Yeah. And the thing about the rounds was kind of cool to me because, like, you could get heat. Like, it was a cerebral kind of thing. Like, just the the, mute, the bell would ring, and then you hit the guy. Then you're, like, with the ref, like, no, no, hey. Right. And the ref, you know. Right. I mean, they would give you a yellow card, yeah. red card. Yeah. It was, they used to fine you. If the heel broke uh, the rule, they would fine the heel. Really? So we would do stuff with the heel. They had a heel referee. We'd do things like I would cheat, I would cheat. The heel would, like, I'd pull the guy's hair, pull the guy's hair. He'd pull my hair. Right. I take a bump. The, the ref sees it, finds the baby face. Yeah. Fans would come forward and pay the fine, yeah. and then we'd all split but it money. at the end of the night. Yeah, yeah. Okay. How long were you down in Germany? I did like four seasons, come four, four seven months right. seasons. I used to go Europe to Japan, Europe to Japan. Okay. Then a little bit. I went to Puerto Rico because I wanted to learn how to do angles and stuff. And you know, now I, I, shooting more angles down there. So, so then in the round system in, in Germany, working with Otto Vance, I mean, that, that's basically three-minute round stuff. Right. Uh, and you learn some chain wrestling. Yeah. The match hard. You go to Japan. And, and was this uh, when strong style was prevalent? Because yeah, you don't seem like you got to be down yeah. with strong style. You, I'll tell you what. I remember everybody in that era, when you would go to Japan, everybody said, well, work strong. The, the short right. the thing was work strong, work strong. So, and then all the guys work out over there. Yeah. Like you get to the building and all the guys are doing squats and push-ups. So you're one of the guys, all the other guy jeans are over there doing it. So it's like, well, then I'm over there doing it. I remember Murdoch was laying on a row of chairs. And he's obviously the top guy. And he's yeah. rocking it every night. Staying yeah. out drinking all night. And rocking it. And he goes, hey, kid. Hey, kid. I go, yes, sir. And he goes, you want to know how I've been coming here for 20 years? I went, yeah, how? He goes, because I sell for these guys. You know, he just... 
it, like being, I just learned so much from Murdoch, and he wasn't, wasn't like he was teaching me. He wasn't going, hey, kid, do it. I learned it from watching it. I'll never forget one match there when I'm in the ring, like I start, and he's going to come in and straighten it out. And I'm doing something, he's going, take him down. Take him down. Now, the fans are so hip in Japan, right. they're going, take him down. Then he's going, tag me, tag me. I tag him. He gets in like this. He takes the guy down. He goes, now you do it. And tags me back in. And so I go, okay. And the fans are getting with it. Like, and then I'm going, and he goes, no, no. Uh, hold him down. Tag me. And we go back and forth where it's working right. like organically. Right. To the point where when I was working for, when I was thinking of angles to go to work for events, like ideas, right. gimmicks. I thought about coming in, I was all muscled up, and I thought, maybe I'll just buzz cut my hair and come in like a badass country boy, and but almost babyface. Like, well, I got him beat, Uncle Dick, and he'd go, you want to be a champion? Hurt him. And I'm going, yes, sir. We're, you know, like, I was thinking of an right. angle like that with Dick. I don't know if Dick would have been down with it, right. but I, I knew that he was so gifted, and I was trying to squeeze it out of him. Uh, was your mind always uh, working like that, thinking of, of the next big thing or, or the angle or, or the identity which, which could make or break you? Not so much me. You know, I get a lot of heat for people saying I'm, I was so selfish and holding people down. I don't see myself. No, no, I just, I, to me it just no, seems like your no, brain's always spinning no, trying to think no, about it. No, I am. And that's what I mean. It, it's not always about me. It's right. Like, sometimes you'll see somebody go, you know how it is. You go through the same thing. You'll see somebody go, oh, I can make right. money with that guy. Right. You know, just the, the guy have a certain look or the way people move and you just... The thing you were doing there with Murdoch, I mean, he, that was basically a shoot. Oh, it was a complete shoot. He was schooling you right there in the middle of the ring. Right. And it was a valuable lesson, a lesson that you learned. Oh, yeah. Before we uh, uh, were rolling cameras, we had some difficulties. You told me one more story about learning. And the, the, thing, uh, the other thing you said about Dick Murdoch, he goes, you know how I've been coming here for 20 years? I sell for these guys. I was talking to Jake Roberts the other day, and he said, as a baby face, one of the most important things you got to do sell. So, you know, basically the same uh, along the lines of what Jake was saying. You had a Tully Blanchard story. You was about to, you came back yeah. from a match. You'd just been working. To tell that story just as far as the learning process goes. I mean, I came back from the ring and, you know, I was on like second or something in front of a big house. I came through and, you know, and I'm just happy I didn't forget everything. And, right. and Tully's right there at the curtain. Hey, kid, can I tell you? Tully Blanchard. You? Yes, sir. And I'm going, yeah, yes, sir. And he goes, uh, I was watching you. A couple things you did. You did that and that. That was good. Keep doing that. That one thing, oh, that was horrible. Don't ever do that again. And so I'm going, and I'm thinking, wow, Tully Blanch is talking to Tommy. He cares talking, for oh me. Oh, my God, like, Tully likes me. And, he, and then he starts to walk on and he goes, oh, and don't be confused. He said, not like I care about you, but I don't want you killing the crowd off before I go out. Because <laughs> the horsemen do this house. Yeah. And I'm like, thanks, I think. Like, I wasn't sure what was <laughs> yeah. it. But I was happy I got the information. But I mean, I, but I, again, that was another light bulb going off. Hey, here's what time it is. Yeah, it's like okay, yeah. Now you may right. now okay. Now this is the bigs. Yeah, you know, this is the Charlotte Coliseum, yeah. whatever. It's sold out. By the way, you had nothing to do with the crowd yeah, being yeah. here, so don't kill them off. Yeah, but like, it's yeah. a heads up. Yeah, like hey, put your big boy tights on. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and it and I like it like that. I like a super competitive environment. I think it's good. I think it's good for business. You were it's not good for the health of the locker room, maybe. Right, right. But it's, it, I heard Vince commenting on it. It's good for business. It's good for business. But uh, before we talk about uh, WCW and the Diamond Stud uh, with Diamond Dallas Page, you, you were recently at a WWE event, and you, sa you saw a sign at the gorilla position. Yeah. And it said, sell intensity. Explain that. I don't know, Steve. I'm so new to being back in the fold that I'm probably going to ask next time I go around. Right. But it says sell and then underneath it intensity. Now, I don't know if that means, okay, guys, remember to sell and then be intense or if it's sell intensity. I don't know. I don't think you can always be intense because otherwise people don't know the difference. Yeah, there's no range. Down, if you don't sell, you can't make right. a comeback. How big of a, uh, a fan of Jerry Lawler's work were you? Because I was a huge Mark Graham. Big fan of Jerry. Okay. And you know what I like about Jerry is... He's like Dick Clark of wrestling. Right. He doesn't age. But he's, and he goes, well, that's because I never worked out. So I don't have to work out now. I mean, but he, also, he's a teetotaler and he never got into anything. Right. You know? But, but my, one of my things, when you talk about intensity, the thing that I loved about Jerry Lawler was, man, he, he started off wrestling a match. It would build to him pulling the strap down, making his comeback. Right. Okay, get into a big, long feud. Because it would take him and Savage. I mean, they're still going to lock up right. and build from that point. And that's what I loved about Jerry Lawler's intensity. There was intensity within the lockup, but he was such a veteran and such a damn good worker. He wasn't a scientific wrestler. People don't really understand that about Jerry. 
he really was more of a brawler. Oh, yeah. You know, he made his living standing up. He'd right. take his bumps. Right. But he, his intensity was at a relaxed tone. And even when he took it to the comeback, he had intensity, but he, he never was going like, you know, maniac. Right. And he told great stories. Have you me? worked with Jerry? I worked with him three times when I first broke into business. And Jerry's one of those guys that's kind of like a ventriloquist. And I don't hear very good, so I started calling my matches at a very young age in the business, although I was still green. So anyway, he's booking. He books three matches with me, Memphis, Louisville, and Evansville. We start walking around that first night. I've been in the business, brother, three months. <laughs> we had him locked up yet. I'm used to locking up with a guy, and then they start talking to me. And so Lawler's a guy, all right, kid, go ahead, lock one tackle, drop down, hit toss. You know, and we're pacing around. Yeah. And there's probably, I don't know, 500 people in the building. And I go, what? <laughs> he called the spot. I used to do that even when I heard the guy. <laughs> what? You know, basically for the guy in the front row, one tackle, drop down, hip toss. You know, <laughs> so anyway, we started locking up from then on. I had only had three matches with Lawler, and I was green as grass. I remember, you got any good Lawler stories? Well, I just remember working with him one time, and he, when you would, like, he would only, he never really bumped. God no, bless that's him. What I'm God bless him. But he would sell down to his knees. Yeah. So, and it, but I, when I worked with him, he was working as a heel. Yeah. So I'm standing over and punching him because I can't toss him around. I respect him too much right. to be bumping him around. Right. So we're just doing some dark match in the TV. Right. So I'm just punching him. And as I'm punching him, he's slapping yeah. me on the side with his head to get the noise. Sound effect. And I'm going, ah, so that's a good way to make me quit punching you because yeah. the slaps hurt. You yeah. know, just. But he would bump, not working with Dundee, he bumped. Uh, right. Working with uh, Savage, you know, some of the, the big backdrop over the, uh, yeah. uh, over the top rope onto the table. He took his bumps when he was working with the right guy. Right. Obviously, had some great matches with uh, Nick Bockwinkel, who he yeah. loved to work with. Yeah. So he would bump when, when, the, when the opponent was right. Thinking about bumps, what, you being a big guy, before, once again, before we get to the diamond stud, what is your take on taking a bump? I... I broke in, you were talking about Ole Anderson earlier. Yeah. I remember one time being in the office at Charlotte, you know, Crockett Promotions in Charlotte, where they had like a studio to film stuff and concrete floor. And because we're just showing up. I mean, I'm on the grounds crew. We're in too green to have matches, but I'm getting paid. So I'm like showing up, hanging around. Sometimes we just hang around and watch interviews. Me and Spivey are standing there. And, and Gene Anderson goes, has us taking bumps on the concrete floor. I was Gene. I never got a chance to watch. Uh, when to I met him, him, I think he... He was like 100. Yeah, and he was working at... They had like a desk job. And yeah. He, I don't know if he'd been hitting the head a lot. Right. I don't know. I didn't have much to do with him. Right. But now he's telling us to bump, and so we're taking bumps on the concrete floor. And and I'm part of me is thinking, man, I'm going back to the strip club scene. What is this all about? <laughs> yeah. This is BS. Yeah. And then he goes, you had enough? And by now, and I'm thinking, screw this wrestling. I said, yeah, what is that, a trick question? Yeah. Like, am I tough enough to keep yeah. doing it, or am I stupid enough to keep right. doing it? What? Right. And, and then he went, I ah, got Actually, I'll never forget, J.J. Dillon walked through right about then. And J.J. was the first guy to show me anything about work. Really? Just, just to work a, like to work a top wrist lock. J.J.? Which, which is something I always go to. J.J. was there. He was Dusty. He always worked with Dusty real well. He was the detail guy. Dusty painted yeah. with the broad strokes, and J.J. filled in the fine points. And he walked by, and he said, no, here, like, here, put me in the headlock. And we, we worked the top wrist lock. Yeah, yeah. And I do that all the time with guys. I got my kid doing that. I said, work the top wrist. Yeah. Nobody does it. It's new. I got my son do a top wrist lock takeover. I said, do it. People who understand wrestling will go, oh, wow, I haven't seen that in years. Right. Yeah. You know, it's so funny. I feel so relevant now in the wrestling scene because I got a son right. who's in the New Japan Dojo, and we DM back and forth all the time. and. I often say what I need to hear. Like, I'm telling him, just keep grinding one day at a time. Put one foot in front of the other. Keep going, right. keep going. And then I'll read it back to him. Wow, I need to apply that to me. But right. it's just, I remember we moved here to Georgia. I moved here to, with Dally on his invitation. Now I live two blocks from Dally. Right. And he goes, and Cody moved here. And I remember we were riding to a show one time. And I go along just film, film his matches with him. I hang out in the locker room with the guys. I walk out with him. I don't like to distract from what those guys are doing. So I stay in the back. I walk out with Cody. I walk back with Cody. And uh, I learned early on that being his wrestling coach and being his dad, there's a division there. Because I like to catch guys like Tully did with me. Right, right. as soon as you come through and go, hey, right. what were you thinking then? Right. And you go, well, I was thinking this. Well, because it looked like this. 
So with Cody, I would say that. And I go, Cody, what do you think? Well, I was thinking this. And I go, yeah, we'll see. It looked like this. And he go, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Right. So that's when I realized, oh, I get it. Because I'm just dad right. to him. I'm right. not Razor. Right. I'm not that NWO guy. Right. I'm the guy who made him eat his vegetables. Right. So then I, now I, I figured out how to deal with that. So I just say nothing until he asked me. Right. So he went through the development where being a worker means, you know, I know how to do moves. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, okay. You're like, I don't say anything to him now. I just let him do his thing. Right. Then we're in the car after one match. He goes, Dad, none of these guys will do what I want to do. And I go, welcome to pro wrestling. It's one thing to be able to do moves. Now, talk the guy into taking them. You know? So he goes, okay. You know, I don't say anything more. Right. The next, next road trip, Dad, like, how did you get guys to do what you want to do? I say, you know what worked for me, Cody, is uh, do what they want to do first. Put them over first. Then right. they can't wait to put you over. Right. So it's just that it's so funny for me to be like on this ground floor level with him. But now you're handling it at a different angle than. Well, I'm hoping it, I'm hoping I'm doing a little bit right. wiser. Right. You know, and I always yield to him. I go, you do what you feel. Right. Yeah, because ultimately he's got to learn it. Yeah. And feeling and, and and that is hand in hand. Going back to your conversation with JJ and him kind of taking you under his wing a little bit and showing you how to work holes. Right. Uh, you, you've always been a very sarcastic guy. Your sarcasm is one of your strong points with relationship to, with uh, respect to how funny you are. W did you have that same sarcasm back in the old days, and how was it taken? Because sometimes if a guy doesn't know you, you're this big, imposing, good-looking guy, uh, kind of disrespectful. Did people get that out of you? Did you rub people the wrong way? Probably. Probably. I mean, I, I think I just kind of stumbled, bumbled through so many opportunities just being a big redneck. Right. And not having any people skills or not realizing that people don't know I'm joking. When did you start putting the people skills together and getting, hey, man, this would work and you got to get along with people? <laughs> okay, maybe not. Never. Right now. Right yeah. now. I'm working on it now. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just, I just realized that for me dealing with people... Um, Everybody is who they are, and you have to accept the good bad qualities and the bad qualities. Right. You know, like you can't just isolate qualities, and I can't isolate them in myself. Yeah. So I just have to give myself a break and, and give the same break to other people. Right. You know, I mean, I always looked at it like there's some guys that I'm going to travel with and hang with and go to the gym with. They're like my, my buds, my yeah. boys. There's other guys, like, then I'm wrestling this other guy every night. So that's a whole different relationship. Like, we ain't going to have dinner together. We're not going to go out and drink together, but... You know, as long as you're clicking in the ring and you yeah. see that guy, you see him in the locker room, it's like, hey, what's up, man? There's that certain bond you have with guys, right. you know. So I always looked at it like that. Like, you know, I always say the same thing. It ain't show friends, it's show business. Right. You know, it's I just as soon get along with everybody. But all that ultimately matters, all I really concerned myself with was what the guy wrestled thought, what the guy who pays me thinks, and what the people who bought tickets think. At this stage in your career, and we're, we're coming up to WCW, but now as you're coming up in the business, uh, what is your education process as far as learning how and what you need to be paid? Barry Windham, uh, your friend who took you. Oh, I remember wing, looking at that check. He left. That's the one he left on. I'm going, whoa. Okay. It was like seven grand. And I went, whoa. Okay, so when this did you start? This is 80s. Yeah. Seven grand on road trips. Right. So when did you start learning about that process? Because these days I'll always tell kids, because you know, back in the day, you know, I started learning what the houses were, where I was on the card, right. putting all the pieces together. Right. And you came in, you know, when you guys left, we're going to get to that. That's when the big money area, that, that's when the big money era happened. Right. So when did you start putting the pieces together as far as pay? I guess I, I remember I was first drawn to wrestling because I just liked the lifestyle. I just thought it was so cool that you get to do this and, you know, you, you got your days free to work out, you work at night, it's kind of cool, people put you over, you're on TV. Well, it's the coolest job in the world. It is the best job yeah. in the world. And so I was always drawn to that. Then, don't get me wrong, then, you know, I just wanted to be dusty. I just wanted to be Barry Windham. I just wanted to be over in Florida so maybe I could meet chicks. <laughs> you know, now... And that's as far as it went. You know, no, I didn't have no yeah. idea. I just wanted to be over in my hometown. And then, it, you know, don't get me wrong, I was all about, about it going global and everything and being huge. And right. I remember the first time I got a doll, I thought, heck, I can retire. Like, I made it. Right. And I never really, never really was concerned about money. I... If it was being paid, I remember we were leaving. I was shooting vignettes with Vince for the Razor character, and we, we he left TV and personally directed him in, in South Beach. I mean, and I know this is good, but I know from being around Kurt to be humble, bumble as can be. Right. I'm just being humble, bumble. 
But then when I hit that Kurt and I'm doing my thing, right. and then when I come back through, I'm not doing, was that okay? Like Kurt said, when right. you come through, you come straight to me. Right. Don't ask people, was that okay? Was that okay? Yeah. And he goes, come straight to me. Walk through like you knew it was okay. If somebody yeah, says, right. hey, good, say thank you, but come straight to me. Right. Like, don't be walking around going, uh, you know. Yeah, because you're questioning. Yeah, you're you're it, losing yeah, that alpha. Yeah, just boom. And uh, I remember, like, it started raining, as it will do down that part of the country. And so we're, we go through the airport, and we're in the car on the way to the airport. And Vince is loving the gimmick because he's never seen Scarface. Right. And I'm just ripping off Scarface. And Vince is laughing. He's loving it. And he's, he tells me to, like, speak really slowly. He goes, there's a difference between commanding attention and demanding attention. Like, he's really involved with the development of this character, which is great for me. Right. And now we're on the way to the airport, and he's laughing. He goes, ah. he goes, you're going to make a lot of money. And my first thought, having been around a little bit, is, would you put that in writing? Yeah. But I went, I said, thanks, Vince. I said, I don't have to have the most. I just want a lot. And he popped. And he goes, you're going to get it. And I'm thinking, things are good. Things are good. I mean, I just... I realized there was a time when I would look at the houses and the way business was going. Now, I was there, and you were there for the tail end, the, you know, all through the steroid trial, which yeah. was sapping resources from Vince, right. you know, through the IcoPro era, yeah. through the WBF. Yeah. Now, who's the backbone of all this stuff? You guys were weathering that storm. Guys on the road. Yeah. So houses were coming up, and business is dead. That steroid scandal hurt business. Right. I was actually being prepped as a witness for Vince by Jerry McDevitt for the steroid scandal because I was more successful off the roids. Right. They were going to call me for it. They never did, but I was prepped for it. Right. And uh, it's just... That conversation with Vince uh, is, is incredible that he would say that to you. Yeah, Because, like, wow. dude, that, a light goes off in your head. One time we were film, filming a vignette, and uh, it was when I first started becoming Stone Cold. And it was myself and Vince and a Jeep Grand Cherokee Limited. We're waiting at a, a gate. It's just a pipe gate with a chain on it, waiting for someone to unlock it. I'm going to throw a belt off something or do something. So we're sitting there. It's Vince and me. It's uncomfortable silence because we don't really know each other, right. dude. I've been working there seven, eight months, but, you know, he's the boss. I'm the dude. Right. I'm not really, like, over yet. Right. So, you know, out of the blue, he just says, you know, Steve, as a promoter, you never want a talent to know what they're worth. And he just said that out of the dead silence. And I was like, bam. Boy, I mean, okay, it's not just with wrestling, Scott. I mean, it's in life. Oh, you yeah. want to pay someone as little as you can pay them exactly. to get any job done. I, but when I, he said that to me with respect to the, the business, I like, okay, now I got to learn how to, how to work the system. And he doesn't say things by accident. No, but, but, but that being said, that conversation he had with you, just that, that, that exchange because he was so caught up in the character, and he, and he said, oh, you're, you're going to make a lot of money out of the blue. Yeah. And then you jumped on that and says, well, you know, it's, as long as it's a lot. Yeah. And it's almost, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's like a rib on the square. Yeah. And it's that come to Jesus meeting. And a lot of guys miss that boat. Right. I want to go, I want to come back to the, the pitch of that character to Vince. But I got to talk about the run with the Diamond Stud in WCW because you were kind of on your ass at this point. I've been working, in, I've been successful in Japan and in Europe, but not in the U.S. where it matters. Right. And I why did, why did uh, uh, going back to AWA, I mean, just Big Scott Hall, Magnum, or Cowboy, right. why, why didn't that catch on? Because you were, you were taking the Hogan spot. Yeah. But, well, the thing is, too, I'll never forget that encounter with the Freebirds when they went, man, we're out of here. This territory's dying. Right. And I was real aware that the, everything was coming my way. And I wasn't ready for that shove. Right. And they were going to put the belts on me. And I remember thinking, I don't want to be captain of this sinking ship. Interesting. I remember they were going around the horn in battle, back when a battle royal drew. Back when just having a battle royal on the car yeah. drew in that NWA territory. Yeah. They would take it around. They would bring in guys for it. Yeah. And we were in, and the, the stipulation was whoever won the battle royal faced Bachwinkle for the title battle next time in that town. Yeah. So we're going to these towns, and I know I'm leaving. I've given my notice to, to Vern. Right. I remember giving my notice to Vern. Back then, it was two weeks' notice. I went and gave my notice, and he was like, huh. Like, nobody leaves me. Nobody leaves on top. And I remember saying, it's too cold here. I said, this is your hometown. I said, I can make two grand a week selling suntan lotion on the beach. I said, I don't, and he goes, I can make you a star. And I remember thinking, I don't have to be on TV to feel good about me. I like me. And he, from that moment, we had to start having a conversation like man to man. Right. And he goes, and um, he goes, he looks at me and he goes, I'm rich. 
And I said, I know. How's it feel? He goes, it feels great. I said, I want to be rich too. I said, but I said, it's too cold here. You know, like, no, this. Right. And, and I knew that although I felt Vern was really captivated by characters like Mad Dog Bashan and all right. that, he always pushed those and, yeah. and like Baron Von Raschke. Right. But he never had any hand in creating them. Right. He loved gimmicks, but he was so vanilla. Everybody was so vanilla in right. AWA at that time. It right. was brutal. And I wanted to be, I was still had my roots in Florida with that coming up on Dusty and Barry and Blackjack Mulligan. And That's Dick, what you Dick really Slater. identified with. I, wanted, I like that Southern style babyface where you told a story and it meant something. And, you know, there was backstory and stuff, not just trade and holds in the ring. I liked it to mean something more. So I gave my notice because what happened was Lex left, 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 Lex left Florida to take the spot in Charlotte. Now, Florida needs a top baby face. I'm unhappy in Minneapolis. Mike Graham calls me, offers me a guarantee. I said, I'm there. Right. And went. What was the look on Vern's face, or, or what was your read on him when all of a sudden, you know, he, he didn't feel like he had you under his thumb? Because well, I mean, it was, it was really cool because he started talking to me man to man. Right. Like, and I said, I want to be That's why he, he knew you weren't a well, marker because, shit. Yeah, I'm not a mark about it. I don't need to be pushed. I'll do jobs on the way out. Whatever you need. Like, I, I remember being in towns, and they go, well, Hall's going over in the battle royal. I said, I'm going to Bakwa. I'm go, don't put me over, Nick, because I'm not going to be here next time you come back. Because everybody thinks I'm just negotiating or something like that to get to squeeze Vern. Right. I, I wasn't. I, just, I was, I was I, a big Nick Bockwinkle fan. Were you? Yeah, but you ever been around Nick much? No, he, now he would come. He would come around <laughs> with his Elvis glasses on. Yeah. Now, hey, like, I like Nick, but he will walk around with his streets... You know, his socks on yeah. and, like, no p- underwear on. Yeah. And you'd be sitting there, like, putting your boots on. <laughs> and Nick comes up like, hey, kid. Like, whoa. Yeah. Like, hey, kid. There's fucking balls in your face. Like, oh, to talk about my boy. I want to talk about your match. Just like, what the fuck? Yeah. In the ring, though. I thought he was great. I remember, they, you know, I, when I look back on the way they handled me in the AWA, knowing more now than I did then, and they put me, they put me with Greg Gagne and Kurt Henning, top baby faces right. they had there, and they're doing everything to take care of me. Right. So I just have to pin the guy. Okay. And they put me out there with Ray Stevens, Nick Bachwing, and Larry Zabisco. Yeah. And like Kaminsky Park, it's some big show. And all I have to do is listen. You know, it's all, right. they're all bumping around for me. And... I was working with Ray Stevens because to this day I've still not seen hardly any of his work, but I always heard that he was just one of the greatest. He, I met Ray towards ahead of his time. I, yeah, what I think what him and Pat Patterson were doing in San Francisco and stuff in the '60s was groundbreaking. Right. You know, it's something that, and I think her, Kurt was really influenced by hanging around Pat Patterson, because Kurt, I t- attribute Kurt with being one of the first guys, although it was probably Pat and Ray, who Whirly's World bumped as a heel for the reaction. Right. Instead of just a lot of heels back in the day, just crumbled down and got juice. Right. Yeah, and it and I think Flair was in that thing. I often blame Flair for the state of my spine, because Flair in our era came along with that flat back and bump. Yeah, remember the spot he pushed the ref, yeah. ref would push him, he yeah. flat back. Yeah, I think when you condition your audience that your top guy is performing that way, if you go on second or third and you're just rotten down, right, it doesn't work. Right, so it became an attack the mat era when we were coming around. Yeah, yeah, and then that's that's the kind of style again. that I yeah get it again. So uh, you go down to Florida, but you end up kind of on your ass. You you need something, or Dallas is in, in dire straits. Well, States now I go something. to Florida, and now the territories come together: Memphis, um, Watts territory, uh, uh, Nashville. Watts some good shit. Nashville. Yeah. They all try to put this super company together to go against Vince. That's out. And so I don't fit. You know, there's no spot for me. So. And the thing is, none of those guys could agree on anything because they all wanted their guy being right. featured. So it fell apart. A good idea, but didn't yeah. work. But meanwhile, Hiro Matsuda, who from the beginning, I had no idea was connected with Florida Championship Wrestling. He knows I'm there. He knows my de- that my deal's in jeopardy now. And being an honorable guy hooks me up with New Japan. Right. And he sends me there as his boy. So my first tour is five weeks. Good, most money I've made at that point. And they keep bringing me back and... What did you think about uh, the Japan style of wrestling? Because you're a guy who loves angles, storylines. I remember being in Kirk and Hall. Means to an end. They brought me to, I just left Minneapolis. Masa Saito had just gotten out of prison in Wisconsin for the incident with Ken Patera at the McDonald's. And so he came to Japan and they brought me in as his tag partner. 
which was a huge push for me. Damn I don't even know it. But he was, the first, he was one of the few guys who was made it in the U.S. and in Japan. Yes. And he goes back there, and they got pictures of him in handcuffs. And it's, people are like, oh, he's a criminal. Because at that time in Japan, it was like a prize fight. They cheered for both guys. They didn't understand, like, why would you use the rope? Right. None of that heat worked with them. And uh, I remember being in the ring of Kirk and Hall. I'm standing there. I'm so nervous. And, you know, and they go, Scott the Hola. And I'm standing there, and, and he walks by, that's you. And I'm like, oh. Like, you know, I just, I didn't, I remember, but I'm still thinking of what Kurt had told me. I'm going, oh, God, I'm going to Japan. I need the crash course. He goes, work strong. He goes, if they put you in any goofy leg holds, go to the rope. They like that kind of stuff. You know, they do. Oh. That's how smart Kurt is. And so I remember one time the guy had me down, this guy Kimura had me down on my belly and my legs wrapped up around me. And I'm going like this and I reach back and busted him wide open. And then now, you know, I come back, I'm in the locker room with Moss, I'm going, oh, please tell him I'm so sorry. He goes, ah, don't worry, office likes it. So then it, I was so green and stiff that they, I started getting a rep as, he don't care. Right. And over there, the Japanese are kind of marks for that. Oh, this is a big one, it works strong, it's good. So, I mean, I'm potatoing guys and the office is liking it. Yeah. And then I'm going to guys later going, hey, I'll buy you a beer, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. You know, but. It worked. Okay, Diamond Stud Air, what happens? Okay, now I've had success in Japan and Europe, but I figure the guys who started with me, guys like Shawn Michaels and stuff, they're all in New York, and I'm not. And I'm looking in the mirror, and I'm thinking I have what it takes, but I'm being realistic enough to go, well, I must not because I haven't made it. So I want the other riches in life. You know, I want to, I want to be married. You know, I want to have kids. I don't care, a little apartment, something. I'll say, I'm thinking I'll work at Sears. Maybe learn how to work a forklift. I'm not dumb. I could be trained. You know, that'd be a steady job. I'm thinking like that. Yeah. And I had one more commitment to make in Europe for Otto for seven months. So I begged this girl to marry me. We go over there, and we're trying to have a baby because I'm coming back, and I'm going to get a real, start a real job. Boy, you committed to that. Yeah. Damn. Well, yeah. And the thing is, now, Nobody has an exit strategy in this business, Scott, and you've got one well, way back. Well, I'm thinking, you know what? I'm going to... I'm not going to be one of them guys who, if I'm not going to be a big star, then I'm really not interested in being in this. Okay. You know, I mean, like, okay, if I don't have it, then I don't have it. Right. And so I remember coming back now, though, the reality is setting in. Ooh, we come back to America. She's seven months pregnant with Cody, who's now 24. Yeah. So this is way back. And it's like, oh, my God, and I don't have insurance or anything like that. I'm working as a bouncer. And I'm going, oh, my, oh my God. God. So I called Dally and... If you, you know Dallas, he's relentless in his work ethic. And he was managing the Freebirds at that time, the new Freebirds, when it yeah. was Jimmy Garvin yeah. and uh, Michael yes. Hayes. And I said, man, you're too big to manage the Freebirds, man. And he goes, no, man, you know, you know Dallas, he's always got it. Yeah. He's always thought about it. No, man, I stand with my legs spare on the interview, so I don't look as tall. And I said, <laughs> I said, you need someone to stand next to you make you look small. I said, you need a diamond stud. And he goes, whoa, bro, bro, bro. So he's off on a tangent. He relentlessly hounds Dusty about it, and I get a tryout. So that was your idea, the Diamond Studs? No, he had talked about making me and Al Perez the Diamond Studs back in Florida, way back in the day. So the seed was planted. He had mentioned that to me, and I just brought it back up to him. As a single. So then he went, he would call me at 3 in the morning, bro, bro, bro. And I got a pregnant old lady. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Bro, you got No one's had black hair in wrestling since Hong Kong. Everybody's got blonde hair. You gotta have black hair. And I'm going, oh man, I don't know. So I dye it brown. You know, I got it blonde at the time. Then a couple of days later, bro, 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 that mustache gotta go. And I'm thinking, you know, like 20 years, like yeah. I had the stash, and it was the 80. You know, people still wore mustaches, and and I'm thinking, like, wow, I don't know, you know. And then he goes, bro, 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 you gotta go with the stubble, the Rob Lowe stubble. He gave me everything. He gave, we were at Waffle. I'm finally now I'm debuting at TV. I've got the black hair. I got the stubble. It was a great look. Thank you. And we're working at we're we're at Fayetteville, North Carolina, and this is before catering at, at TVs. Yeah. So we're at a Waffle House. It happens to be at the end of the parking lot. Like yay, we're in there eating. We're paying the bill, and Dallas grabs a toothpick. She goes, "Bro, I got it. I got it." <laughs> He's going, "I got it. We'll both have toothpicks." So, and I'm, th- I'm so happy to have a J-O-B. I've signed a one-year deal. I don't care. I'm, yeah. I know I'm good for a year. Yeah. I got a pregnant kid, you know, like, yeah. and uh, 
So the thing is, and he had browbeat Dusty to get the Janet Jackson like headphone mic so he could use his hands when he talked. Yeah. So we're walking down the aisle. He's talking. He's talking. We get in the ring. He's talking. His toothpick falls out. And I don't talk. Dallas is talking. But I know enough. Now I've been around a few years. Yeah. I see the red light on the camera. I went, bing. And after that, you're the guy with the toothpick. And I go, I sure am. I sure am. <laughs> you know, like, he gave, me, he gave it all to me. And the same thing about Dallas is cut from that same cloth as Kurt. He's not selfish. There's nothing selfish yeah, yeah. about him. He gave me that gimmick. Now, backtrack to, I get home from TV. There's three messages on my voicemail from Pat Patterson. Now, prior to this, I've been, I'm asking Kurt, what do I do? What do I do? He goes, just call the office ask for Pat. I call Steve, I call once a week for a year. Every me? week. I, every, every week I call. Can I speak to Pat Patterson, please? Um, who's calling? This is Scott Hall calling. One minute, please. I'm sorry, Pat's in a meeting. Um, we'll just please tell him Scott Hall called. Thank you very much. Every week. Straight up. Every week. Because I'm fuck it. What do I got to lose? Right. He's not talking to me anyway. Right. I'm right. just going to ask for a tryout. <laughs> yeah. So now I get back, and now I got three voicemails from Pat. So I'm going, well, ain't this something? So I call Pat. Can I speak to Pat Patterson? One moment, please. Hey, kid. Hey, goddamn it. Hey, kid. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah I like your shred. Right. Hey. You, the, the other 500 phone calls. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Like, yeah. So he, yeah. Goes, he goes, hey, kid, Vince loves the new look. And I'm saying, thank you, Pat. Thank you very much. Well, listen, I'm just going to come right to the point. Did you sign a contract with them sons of bitches? And this is all setting in on me, and I'm going, Pat, I just, and now I feel comfortable because I'm not asking you for anything. Right. I go, Pat, I just got done driving from Atlanta back to Orlando. They don't even fly me. I drive from the contract signing. And he goes, I said, Pat, I don't want to work for them. I wouldn't have called your office every week for a year if I did. And he's going, calm down. You know, Pat, calm down, yeah, kid. Yeah. Calm down. Don't worry. You'll be able to tell them in a year New York wants you. Right. So a year goes by, right. no contact from New York. So now I call Pat, I mean, I call Kurt and go, bro, I'm done here. They're not doing anything with me here. I said, you know what? If I'm destined to be a job guy in this business, I want to do it for Vince. The lowest paid guy in wrestling makes a pretty good living. Right. I remember saying to him, give me Barry Horowitz a spot because Barry Horowitz had a baseball card. Right. Because I figure if I'm going to do jobs for a living, I'll do them, and I want to do it at the best place around. But, dude, I don't really remember too much of your diamond stud runs because I, I was doing my thing. But So how was I? I mean, you were you was working mid-card, working top. Yeah, well, the thing that Dallas and I got together about was, let's, you know what, the fans don't know how much I make. Right. I'm going to act like I'm the shit. Right. If you act like you're the shit, you become the shit. Yeah. You know, Vince, perception becomes a reality. Yes. If you act like you're the deal... And Dally had the thing with the diamond dolls, and we started doing this thing, strip the stud. Right? I had tear away clothes on. We and now he would bring these hotties, yeah, yeah. and have them come. They'd hang around at TV for nothing for free. Because Dallas used to be in the nightclub business. Yeah, so he and, he, would have, and yeah. he was he would browbeat the broads. He'd go, "No, what else you got to wear?" He would make them try yeah. on outfits and stuff. And I'm just I'm so shy. I'm going like, "Thanks for coming." You know. And and Dallas is very meticulous to detail. I mean, he knows what he wants. So then we started doing the thing with Dally where. We would invite girls from the audience to come down. I'm working an angle with the Z-Man. So we'd go to the ring and talk our little smack, and Z-Man comes out. So we started doing a thing where I, we'd invite girls from the audience. This girls would come from the upper deck and come down. And then I would lean over and whisper in his ear, like, no. And he'd go, you're right, Stud. Honey, you looked a lot better when you were way up there. Go on back. Now the people are booing. Yeah. Boo. And we would do a spot with Z-Man where he would come off double cross body, us yeah. both off the top. And yeah. I mean, yeah, it... Uh, yeah, Dallas, at the same time, I had some, I butted heads with Dally a little bit because he was so active on the outside. And managers need to just, don't do anything, then you do one thing. And I finally, one time, I remember going, Dally, it's not the Diamond Dallas Page show, bro. I'm out there trying to work. I mean, he didn't know. He was trying to contribute. Yeah, he, you know. trying too hard, he was taking the attention away from yeah. the match. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what was the name of that finish? Diamond Death Drop. Diamond Death Drop. How did you come up with that? Which would, be, which would become the razor's edge. Yeah. So. It, uh, I think that the first time I did it to anybody was in Puerto Rico. Like, the powerbomb was getting really big at the time. Right. I remember powerbomb was like, oh, my God, when guys were first doing that. Like, whoa. Oh, yeah. And so I just kind of morphed it out of that. And... But you came up with it. Yeah. So did you ever have a hard time talking to someone and taking that bump? Because it looked like a scary bump because I got a stack of dimes probably. Yeah. It, uh, 
And in the squash match here, like if guys would dead weight me, right. then I'd let them have it. Yeah. You know, if guys would go up good, then I'd put you down flat. If you're going to make me hoist you up there, then tuck your chin. Really? Well, it was a different era, too. Yeah. I don't think I ever took that, did I? No, no. I, st- <laughs> I gave you the stunner. <laughs> this has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. This February on Pluto TV, we're putting the spotlight on iconic black talent. Watch your favorite movies like Top 5, 48 Hours, and More Than a Game. And drop in to binge black TV classics like The Bernie Mac Show and Moesha. Pluto TV has hundreds of channels and thousands more movies and TV shows all for free. So download the Pluto TV app on your favorite streaming device and start watching today. Pluto TV. Drop in. Watch free. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Of course you would. And when it comes to great rates on insurance, Geico can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners or renters coverage. Plus, add an easy-to-use mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And Geico is an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save. It's simple. Go to geico.com or contact your local agent today. Hi there, and welcome to The Inevitable. This is our new podcast where we're talking about the future of the car. This means everything from electrified vehicles to cars that drive themselves. Where are we going and how will we get there? I'm Johnny Lieberman from Motor Trend, joined by... Ted Lowe, and we are going to talk to some amazing guests. We have Reggie Watts, we have Sung Kang, we have James Marsden, we have Spike Fairston, Kristen Lee, Derek Jenkins, a whole bunch of actors, celebrities, car are crazy folks, people from in and outside the industry. It's going to be great. And you can find it on podcastone.com or anywhere you find you listen to your favorite podcast. We're also doing a video series as well. That's on motortrend.com slash the inevitable or on youtube.com slash motortrend. Come join us. Yo, what's good? It's your boy, Big Brother Jake, a.k.a. Jake Warner. My government name. Check it out. I host a show called the Big Brother Jake Podcast, and I've taken my talents to the biggest and baddest platform on the planet. That's right, baby. Podcast 